Welcome back to the 50 Shades of Horror Challenge. I'm your host, Roommate. Today we'll look at the 22nd movie in the series, 2021's Last Night in Soho. Here's where you can find this movie available for streaming, though as a new release you can find it at Redbox Machines as well. And according to the kiosk where I rented this movie, it isn't even a horror movie, but rather suspense. What the actual fuck? But Wikipedia backs me up, calling this a psychological horror film. You fit right in. This is certainly a different kind of horror movie than we've been covering lately. While I've yet to receive a comment telling me that I have the order of this challenge wrong, that one movie is actually less scary than the ones that came before, I imagine this selection will be more contentious, once I have more than 40 subscribers so people start actually arguing with me. And thank you for continuing to spread the word about my channel, it helps so much. It's the least I <laughs> this is a movie about nostalgia, which is presented as a double-edged sword that is equal parts glamour and horror. So the movie spends a significant portion of its runtime reveling in the stylish glory of the swinging 60s, which is not exactly known for curdling blood. If I could live any place in any time I'd live here, London in the 60s. But precisely because of this glossy veneer of carefree classiness, the discoveries of Eloise Turner strike a frightening chord, ringing out to warn us of the twisted machinations behind a perceived golden age. This movie is mysterious, with some big twists, so as always, I recommend you watch it first, so you take the journey the movie has laid out for you. Though not every mystery is revealed before the credits roll. Our hero Ellie lives in the English countryside with her maternal grandmother. I'm sorry? You know, Cornwall in the countryside. No, no, I, I heard you, babe. I'm just, I'm sorry. And we learn that her mother took her life about a decade ago. It was a long time ago. You're like, so brave. So brave. What we never learn is who her father is, or who her grandfather is. So what does your dad do? Uh, I don't know him. Of course, I don't expect every movie to give a full family tree of its characters, but this particular movie focuses on the scarcity of genuinely good men and the ease with which corrupt men can pass themselves off as respectable. So while it's thematically likely that both her father and grandfather's absence are explained by some selfish reasons, it's never quite clear. Another unclear aspect is the nature of Ellie's visions. In good times and in bad, Ellie perceives things that aren't there, most evident in her vivid dream sequences when she is transported back to the 60s in Soho. These could be explained by mental illness, that her brain could be organizing details that her conscious mind can't process. But she could also be a time-traveling, mind-reading wizard. I saw landmarks in my dreams, details of nightclubs, places I'd never been to before, and then I saw those details in real life. And while Occam's razor points to the latter, there's no definitive proof. This uncertainty about what she's going through is a big part of why this movie strikes me as so frightening. The other characters trying to make sense of Ellie's actions without seeing what she sees is scary, because if she has insight others don't, then they need to listen to her. But if not, then they need to stop her. Being in the position of not knowing whether someone you care about is dangerous or misunderstood is terrifying, because you'd have to choose to support them, which might be enabling an illness, or to oppose them, which might burn one of the few bridges they have left. Something's wrong. No. <laughs> Ellie? I can hear it in your voice. Nowhere is this ambiguity more apparent than Ellie's interactions with who we come to know as Lindsay. His leers give her good reason to be suspicious of him, and as she dreamwalks into Sandy, she thinks she has him pegged as an older Jack. By the film's end, we learn that she has it wrong, though, as Lindsay was in actuality a vice cop that had met with Sandy. This mischaracterization costs him, as when he vehemently denies playing a role in Sandy's downfall, he is struck by a car. Though even the responsibility for that misfortune is clouded, as Lindsay had admonished Ellie just a few days earlier for blindly walking into traffic, so the incident paints him as a hypocrite. Which way are you going, Del? And while the mistaken identity calls the validity of Ellie's perspective into question, this falsehood exposes a truth that would have been impossible without the error. Both Jack and Lindsay knew Sandy and sought to control her with an air of judgmental detachment. Come on, they're waiting for ya! They both thought she was foolish, believing her personal worth to start and end with her physical appearance. Get out while you can, girl. You're better than this. I don't think I am. Of course you are. Just look in the mirror. They both wanted her to play a subservient role to men. A powerful message is sent by having a supposed protector be so indifferent to the manipulative abuse of women that he could be mistaken for her pimp. Like I give a flying fuck. Last Night in Soho is at its most frightening in this aspect. The romantic nostalgia that Ellie feels for the 60s is hollow, as it is shrouded by myths spun by the greedy to weaponize the dreams of the naive against them. They lured hopeful innocence with promises that artistic passion, talent, and confidence would open up a world of prestige and merriment to them. It's closed. 
not for you. But when that goalpost was just out of reach, it would be pulled further back, revealing the supposed path to be a mire of self-degradation. If you were to refuse the way, you'd be accused of not wanting it enough. Everybody else is doing it. What makes you so special? And if you were to submit, you'd be gaslighted into thinking that this was what you had always wanted. You were the one who wanted this. So these unlucky women would sink further into the muck as their dreams disappeared behind the horizon. I hope you were all listening to that. Something about the 60s. Ellie interprets the death of Sandy's innocence and aspirations as her literal demise. Of course, the finale reveals that she is much too tough for that. I wasn't going to let this city break me. By twisting her dreams of glory into a wretched existence as a commodity, her pimp and her johns made a monster of her. But she lost more than just her sense of optimism. Life lost all meaning to her. They had used her, ignoring her wishes, to fix their broken sense of self-worth by exercising power over her. They send me to hell. So... I sent them to theirs. She learned from them, taking their already ugly bid for pride and upping the ante. As she took the lives of all the men who had taken her joy, she gained a twisted satisfaction, finding value in herself as an excellent murderer. It felt right, Ellie. The lines between victim and aggressor blur, as not only does Sandy become a greater evil, but the men who put this upon her appear more pitiful. The escalation into lethal violence hurts them more than they hurt her, sure. But beyond that, we are shown that her motivations are born from pain incurred as she was derailed from an idealistic goal. You could say Sandy died in that room. She died in that room a hundred times. This certainly calls into question the motivations for spending their nights with her. Maybe they were conned into playing the opposite side of this gross charade. Maybe they too once had more pure romantic expectations but were slowly bound by a toxic web they had ignorantly stumbled into long ago. While being an aspiring star who is forced to sell her body is an unenviable position. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> The same could be said for someone whose only way of being close to those they desire is to pay for it. Seriously. Or even someone who gives up a person who could be their soulmate for a bit of cash, too blind to see that your world is only as cynical as you let it be. Oh, what am I saying? <laughs> and while so many of the men in Last Night in Soho are jaded and manipulative, the movie also has one of the sweetest male love interests ever in the character of John. Respectful, attentive, enthused, and supportive, he comes into Ellie's life when she is overwhelmed by negativity both psychic and mundane. He shows her that there are trustworthy people in this often shady place. My auntie believes in all sorts of weird shit. So you just tell me how I can help. As another contrast, Ellie's brief roommate of Jocasta shows how being female doesn't exempt you from starting your own bitter cycles of degradation. She is insecure, dealing with the pressures of making a name for herself in the challenging atmosphere of fashion school in the most belligerent way possible by choosing who she thinks is an easy target to denigrate for personal aggrandizement. Not that it's a competition there, is it? <laughs> The inclusion of these characters that defy the overall dynamic of the movie makes it clear that the issue is with the individuals who disrespect others. And while this problem has a gendered component, it doesn't entirely reduce to being a problem men pose to women. Little liar! As the movie ends, we don't see Ellie relinquish her love for the 60s despite the darkness she has found within it. She realizes that the passion she has, that John has, that Sandy had once upon a time, has always been real. That is where the real magic always laid, in the image the hopeful held in their minds, not in the seedy back rooms where dreams went to die. The confidence that had Sandy walk into the best club in the best city and demand to be its star. I want to be your new headline act. Where have you played before? Nowhere. Who starts at the Café de Paris? Me. Ellie brought that back to life with her rose-tinted nostalgia and resurrected in this fashion designer decades later, the spirit of independent exuberance finally can be freed unmoored from its legacy of pain and desperation. This is just a taste of things to come, Sandy. This week's recommendation for another review is from Amanda the Jedi. Her channel is focused on new movies and TV series, and she's not afraid of letting you know when a popular new release doesn't impress her. Thankfully, that wasn't the case with Last Night in Soho, as she shows in this clip where she explains how refreshing it is to see a different spin on the conception of a ghost story. This is the stone tape theory, which is about how highly emotional and traumatic events can be recorded onto physical items and replayed. So these ghosts aren't really spirits of the dead, it's their pain and Sandy's trauma recorded. 
supported. All that energy stayed trapped in the wall along with the bodies. And I really love that. I think it's such a unique take on the haunted house. So check out Amanda the Jedi's The Twisted Horror of Last Night in Soho Explained. The link's in the description. See you next Saturday for the 23rd entry in the series, which will be 1986's The Fly. Here's where you can find this body horror movie available for streaming. Until then, be afraid. Be very afraid.